Romance and opulence in the films of Elvis director Baz Luhrmann. It's no surprise that Baz Luhrmann chose Elvis as the subject of a biopic. Glamour, pop culture, and romanticism have been central themes in his films since his debut in the early 90s. A flair for the dramatic. Baz Luhrmann's films adhere more closely to the conventions of ancient Greek or Brechtian theater than to modern taste for realism. Luhrmann frames his spectacular stories in such a way that the audience is constantly aware that they are watching a show. In fact, most of his films concern themselves with performance and showmanship, often containing shows within the show. Luhrmann is an auteur, but not in a sense that's easy to define. His style is not marked by signposts or signature shots like Wes Anderson's title cards or Spike Lee's dolly rides. He does, however, have a distinct touch, and there are certain common threads between his films that make them easily recognizable as his work. For example, his soundtracks are blends of music from different eras. There are usually more than a few dreamlike montage sequences, and all of his films are polished and ornate to the point of being decadent. One phrase that commonly gets repeats in the descriptions of Lerman's films is over the top. He crafts unrestrained visual collages that ride the line between being kitschy and euphoric, which prevents his films from having universal appeal. But when his over the top style hits its mark, it makes for true movie magic. La Boheme. The closest thing to an auteur's signature, Lerman uses the mantra, truth, beauty, freedom, love. The motto for the Bohemians in Moulin Rouge seems almost to be the ethic of every leading character in Lerman's films. The words even made a visual reappearance in the opening of Lerman's most recent film, Elvis. From strictly ballroom to the nearly three-hour epic Australia, something of the Bohemian spirit prevails in Lerman's movies. This is most obvious in the films that are explicitly about artists. Strictly Ballroom follows Scott, played by Paul Mercurio, a professional dancer, and Fran, played by Tara Morais, the woman he teaches to be his dance partner. Scott, why aren't you- There's no time. Do you still want to dance with me? Scott teaches Fran to follow her own heartbeat in order to find her rhythm. The pair prove their love to Scott's parents, as well as the merit in their unconventional style of dance, through a breathtaking dance routine. The story drips with romance and idolism. Similarly, Moulin Rouge tells the love story of aspiring writer Christian, played by Ewan McGregor, and the courtesan Satin, played by Nicole Kidman. This tale of forbidden love takes place in the heart of Bohemian Paris, the namesake of Puccini's La Boheme, of which Lerman directed a stage adaptation. You, baby, you were made for loving me. The only way of loving me, baby, is to pay. The ideals of truth, beauty, freedom, and love are opposed by the transactional nature of prostitution represented by the Duke, played by Richard Roxburgh which results in the sort of beautiful tragedy that romantic types relish. Lerman's most recent film, a dizzying reflection on the life of Elvis and the iconography of the 50s, 60s, and 70s, paints the musical icon as a quixotic superhero. This is right tonight! You're looking for trouble? You came to the right place. The most effective and transporting scenes are those when Elvis, played by Austin Butler, performs, and the music transforms the entire world. This all-consuming energy and its commercialization by Colonel Tom Parker, played by Tom Hanks, reflects the seedy, tragically beautiful world of Bohemian Paris as portrayed in Moulin Rouge. These three films are sensual and rich, romantic to their core, and by my estimation, Lerman's best. It takes an idealist eye to portray Paris in the early 20s 
20th century or the mythical persona of Elvis Presley. Telling a realistic, gritty story about either of those subjects would somehow miss the psychological mark. There are things that hold transcendent meaning, and Lerman deals with them as they live in our minds because it's somehow more truthful to do so than to recreate the objective truth. Strictly Ballroom does the same with ballroom dancing, heightening the drama that already exists in the competitive dance world with unironic flair. Anachronistic Adaptations Though Romeo and Juliet and Jay Gatsby are not bohemian artists, these characters are romantic in the same way, wrapped up in high ideals and pursuing something just out of reach. One of Lerman's most recognizable directorial practices is the inclusion of both modern music and music that's contemporaneous with his movie's settings. It's thrown into particularly sharp relief in his adaptations. William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet sees the classic story retold in modern Miami. Have not saints' lips and holy palmers too? I, a pilgrim, lips that they must use in but featuring costuming that's heavily influenced by Elizabethan theater and a musical mix of hip hop, prog rock, and pop. The Great Gatsby, meanwhile, shows a dazzlingly bright version of 1920s America. Some of the shots in the film are framed with Art Deco metalwork, and some of F. Scott Fitzgerald's words appear on the screen before wafting away. Its soundtrack, too, features a melange of genres. Neither the heightened realities nor the blended soundtracks are unique to Lerman's adapted films, but in the adaptations, it makes his artistic goals far more explicit. His versions of Romeo and Juliet and The Great Gatsby attempt to capture the timeless romantic heart of those stories. Lerman tracks the connection between then and now, bringing closer to home the motivations of nearly unbelievable characters. His anacrostic stylings also heighten the feeling that we, the audience, are attending a show. We are simultaneously pulled into the sweep of the story, a reminder that it has been packaged and delivered for our entertainment. This is, I think, one of the dynamics that make Lerman's film so divisive. It's a somewhat obvious conceit, and yet no one else pulls it off with such gusto. Opulence can be exhausting. What makes Lerman's film so compelling can also be what makes them headache-inducing. He matches larger-than-life subject matter with larger-than-life tricks of editing, including swirling, sweeping dolly shots, blurred close-ups, immediately followed by still snapshots, or even, in the case of Elvis, a blackout by way of a shrinking point of light becoming so small you have to squint to see it. That last example is perhaps the best to illustrate what I mean. At the end of Elvis, I watched the blackout in awe. I didn't want the spirit of Elvis to leave the theater, and yet, I had a headache by the time the movie was over, worsened by squinting at that pinprick of light. The same thing has happened with Moulin Rouge, each of the dozens of times I've seen it. There are other filmmakers who bring me to the edge of my seat without the subsequent need for Advil, but there is something sublime in the sheer opulence of Baz Luhrmann's films. He manages to capture the soaring sensation you feel when you dance to your favorite music or arrive at a travel destination as well as the excitement of seeing something you're not supposed to. Australia, the odd one out. A fixation on opulence and romance make Lerman a singularly qualified candidate to take on subjects like Romeo and Juliet or Elvis Presley. But what happens when he's given the entirety of Australia to work with? It's a pleasure. Neil. Lerman's campy epic is a romance fit for Hollywood's golden age between the refined Lady Ashley, played by Nicole Kidman, and the wily brutish Drover, played by Hugh Jackman. Their trek through the Australian outback is guided by the mystical influence of King George, who is played by David Gulpilly, the aboriginal grandfather to Nula, which is played by Brandon Walters, a mixed race child being tracked down by the vengeful Neil Fletcher, who is played by David Wenham. Epic in scale, but still executed with Lerman's over-the-top sensibilities, Australia reads a little differently than his other films. Whereas the elephant in Moulin Rouge and the abandoned Proscenian arch on the beach in William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet allude to larger bodies of shared knowledge between the audience and the director, the symbolism in Australia is self-contained. The relationship between the romantic Leeds and Nula, for example, reads as an allegory for Australians of European descent and Aboriginal Australians learning to overcome their differences and doesn't rely so much on imagery from our collective subconscious. Rather than being riddled with cultural references in service of a new vision, 
Australia is a pastiche of an older style of filmmaking leaning towards the melodramatic. Basmark, the odd one in. Born Mark Anthony, Basmark Lerman earned the nickname Baz in high school and later changed his name by deed, combining his names into one. Lerman has repeated in a good number of interviews that he grew up in a small town, entranced by the silver screen. Perhaps his love affair with stories being told from across the Pacific Ocean in Hollywood is what made him into such a distinct personality and subsequently a director like no other in the business. Regardless of how you feel about Lerman's films, there was something so passionate and alive in them that it's hard to deny their significance. As movies and television become more and more cynical and true to life, Lerman's films stand out as bastions of unapologetic romanticism. He has managed to secure large budgets for every film following his debut, and even directed the most expensive advertisement of all time, number five, the film for Chanel. And my family, and my extended circus family, there's no job. There's just the art. There's no... Something about his work feels so vitally important, especially for anyone in show business. Something touching the pulse of truth, beauty, freedom, and love. 